So this is going to be how the other side cuts. So my idea with this talk, because I knew I was going to come here, I'm talking to fasteners, so I can get very nerdy, very technical, and you guys are going to follow me. And I know that I'm talking to mostly American fasteners, so I thought it would be interesting to give you guys an idea about what's going on in the world of fastening in Europe, in Asia, and just get an idea of what it looks like to fasten on the other side, whether that means on the other side of the birth, or maybe just not only halfway around. So I'm Justin Prim. Many of you guys have seen me before. I am a gem cutter. I have been chronicling the history of gem cutting now for about six years. And I wrote, uh, started the school, Fastening Apprentice. I've got a book in the, uh, the vendor's room. So if you guys want to come and see some of the uh, stuff that I'm going to talk about in here, Design Wise is in that book. And I've uh, trained with cutters all over the world at this point, as well as a couple of the visuology programs. So, uh, hopefully I'm coming to you guys with a lot of interesting knowledge. So, the journey that I want to take you on today, how the other side cuts. I want to give you a brief history of fasting technology, because I'm going to talk about some really technical stuff, you know, actual techniques and stuff, and we have to understand a little bit about the machines and where they come from, so that that would make sense. So I'll run through that for a minute, and then we're going to look at some of the techniques of old Europe. Some of these are antique techniques, but a lot of them are stuff that people are still using today. I just came back from, from London, and I've just been continuously downloading this old information from these guys. So I put a bunch of that stuff in here. And the point of this is to really contrast it with the way that you guys are probably cutting with the meat point technique or the American technique, and ju just show a, a slightly different way of bidding to the same end point. And then once I walk you through some of the techniques, I'll show you a couple of just quick videos to see what does it actually look like, how does it look when they're doing it, and uh, I'll, I'll conclude with just a little glimpse into the world of precision melee cutting and talk about how are they cutting tiny but perfect gem spins. So let's get into a little bit of the history. This is always my favorite subject. Hopefully you guys like it too. So if we want to look at gem cutting going all the way back to the beginning of human history, it's going to look something like this. We can go back a million years, you know, we've got stone tools that are literally just stones that have been rubbed against other stones. So something that looks like this, this is a historical reenactment, but you can imagine taking a stone and rubbing it in a, a stone, slit mapping it like that, and making it a tool. And then as we move on, we start to use those same ideas in order to actually shape stones or jewelry to make a gem. And the oldest piece of jewelry that I've ever seen is about 200,000 years old. This is beads made of shells on a necklace, I think from around the mid sea So we can imagine 200,000 years old, this is actually older than the human species. So we're talking about our ancient, ancient ancestors. So we have those kinds of techniques going all the way up until the end of the medieval period. We can see this guy, he's grinding a stone, not just against another stone, now he's grinding the stone against a piece of copper, probably, so that he can grind it to polish it, but also sometimes to grind it for medicinal purposes. Cinnabar being poisonous, I hope it's not being used for medicinal purposes, but we don't know. They had weird ideas back then. So we would have been grinding stones like this, whether we're making flat things, cabochons, you know, uh, just, just flat platelets that we know in the jewelry. But this is pretty much how people would do it before we had any special technology to do it. So once we get into the 1500s, the flywheels invented, along with the <coughs> other inventions. And so now some of us thought, okay, if we attach this wheel to a rope, to another wheel, and we can see what this guy's doing. He's got the stick in his hand, and he's just turning the wheel. I think there's probably a little bit of uh, artistic legs in here, and probably should be turning something not just turning the wheel by hand, but something like that. You got a stick in the hand. <coughs> you can imagine if you have a stick in your hand and you try to cut a stone with facets on it, that would be very far, right? Going back and finding your angles and finding your indexes, I wouldn't want to do that. So we go a couple hundred years further into the future. So we're still in, you know, this is all sort of happening in Europe, and now they've taken that same tail with the hand crank thing, and then add the one big piece on the sort of, you can see I've got an antique one here. This one's coming from Sri Lanka, but the original ones of which they were coming from Prague. So this is the quad. It's basically going up and down on this pole, 
And the stone that's on that stick now can go in there. So instead of just having to hold it freehand, they've got a handle that has angles. They can hold the rotation. It's not very mechanical, it's very crude. And you can see it's just going into essentially a rag. But that's how we're doing it. And they spray all over here. So we see some from Prague, some from France, some from London, all the way up until really the beginning of the 1800s. This was the major machine of Europe. When we get into the 1800s, we see the next biggest development, and this is the development that places all the quadrants on Europe. So this is the original jam. So the jam bag is a really simple device. It's a piece of wood and a bunch of holes in it. You have that same stick in your hand, just like you've got for the last 400 years. But now that stick can go into a hole. And as it hits the back, depending on which hole you choose, it's going to change your hand. So we can see the French one looks pretty much like the London one. The London one eventually comes to New York. And in the beginning of Bath and Country, you see all the professional cutters of New York are using one like this. I just got this a couple of weeks ago, so to me this is amazing to actually find a New York, you know, 100 year old jam pit. But that's what I really use, and still today, some people are using which one. Um, to go into London today, we're still seeing, you know, this company that Hig has just closed last month, so people are still using this gene. And we can see it being shown in some illustrations of the time. This is from about 1820. This is probably from around 1850, and we can see and the common shape wooden jank that they used on the hand crank machine. And same here, the British style common shape with the hand crank machine. So this is pretty much the big news thing when we come into the 1800s. Now, by the time we get to the end of the 1800s, and the rest of Europe has completely got this technology, and nobody's thinking about quadrant hand pieces anymore. We got the jam bed, version two. So this is what I'm calling version two. So they've taken that same idea, a piece of wood with holes in it, and they've added this metal stick onto it. So it's really a case. The inside's still that same wooden jam thing that you've got for you now 480 years. Uh, now we've got index. So this is the first time we really got a proper index. So this stick has eight sides on the metal. It's a metal wing at the eight sides. They put this metal plate on here so that the eight sides have something to push against. So that gives you eight indexes. And then there's a little tooth on here where you rotate it around so you can get your eight mains and rotate it through your eight stars, rotate it, you have your brakes, rotate it, you have your brakes, everything's in groups of eight. And now since you have an indexing system, that means we can also have a cheater. But this is the cheater valve. It just tilts the machine a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and they can adjust the facets. And also we have now a gear height adjustment. So this has really got a lot of modern features. We've got gears, we've got angles, we've got indexes. We don't know our angle number. We don't know the specific angle, but we not, you know, reference points. And because of this invention, France became the number one gem cutting region of the world. Between 1880 and 1920, France had like 8,000 gem cutters. And they were doing all of the work of the world. This is way before we had Asia doing this, it was France. And so you can see these, it's, it's a lot of times that the best in the morning, a couple were in the house. Kids would start working even when they were 12 or 15 years old. Um, it's far as dying, but... Different story. The what? Different story. Oh, okay. This, yeah, this is not for dying. This is the only for the colored stones. Dying would have had their own packing machines with their own kind of hand pieces, and they would not have been hand crank, because that here, it doesn't work. So, we can see the, the invention, the you know, the, the, the the invention of this mechanical stick and this new type of jam tank, it was pretty much revolutionary. They became the number one world leaders of, of gem fighting, and eventually, as we're going to see in a minute, this technology spread all around the world. So only France really adopted this. We don't see it happening in any of any other parts of Europe. Really, it's just a French thing. At the same exact time that the French were inventing this, we've got the Americans first starting to dabble in their own kind of gem cutting. So we've got these early type of maps machines, like this one for 1892, this one that's in my collection for 1904, and then this great machine that I hope someday find somewhere in Colorado. This is the uh, portable mass machine hand crank 
by Professor B. O. Long here. He used to commute to work on the train. He would sit there on the train and, and fasten stones on his lap on the train seat. You can't really see it in this picture, but underneath of his hand, there's a little metal mast, and here's his, here's his quill. You see, Lee's got angles and sort of an indexing system up there, all the way back in 1995. And you can see this one in 1904. I mean, this one pretty much could be an early, early all the time for all intents and purposes. And at the same time, we've got another type of American machine being developed, which is the large quadrant. So you can see this one here. It's got a huge quadrant here. There's a arm sticking out. He's currently cutting a table right now. So that's his table adapter. But so these are some of the early experiments in America. So now we've seen quadrants, we've seen uh, jam we have seen mass. And to complete our little historical journey, we've got to look at the hand piece, because this is part of it as well. So the hand piece design, we can find an early picture going back to 1850. And notice we've got a little angle block in here. We've got the sort of a clock face here with a little wand that's going to tell us where we are in our rotation. So it's sort of an index here. And when we go 100 years later in Germany, we can see a pretty similar idea, but much, much more advanced. We've got an index here with a cheer. We've got an angle with a line and a custom. We even have a acting call in the hand piece. Now, this seems like they thought of everything, right? All the controls are there. All the little adjustments are there. But actually, this machine kind of sucks. It's really heavy. It's overbuilt. It doesn't work very well. So somebody from Japan came and saw this, and they got the idea that they could actually make it better. So we see the first Emahashi's coming in the 1960s, inspired by that jumping design. So they've taken off the fourth foot, and taken off the height control and put it onto the machine, so now the hand is light, and it's much less complicated, and they've just simplified the head much more than that other one was. And then that goes to Sri Lanka 10 years later, and we see the Sri Lankans start to copy it and simplify it again, make it lighter, make it cheaper, make it easier to manufacture. And eventually, this is today's model, and we've got pretty much all the same features. Angle, index, we've got the cheater here, and then the height control is on the machine. So all these machines pretty much can do all the same things. They're all going to make faceted stone. But they're going to do it in a totally different way. So we've got you know, these three different traditions, the Japanese machine coming from Europe, the hand beast machine that's sort of Japanese turned Sri Lanka, and then the mass machine, which is, of course, coming from right here. But when we think about the wider world of Jim Payne today, and then I'm talking about the professional commercial world, the world is really ruled by the Jim Payne's, whether we're living in France or Thailand, which is one of the biggest Jim cutting cups in the world, or Israel, which is one of the biggest Jim cutting cups in the world, or South America, which is one of the biggest gem cutting of the world, or India, which probably is the biggest gem cutting of the world. We're just seeing gem pens all the way through. And really, the only major cutting center that's not using a gem peg is Sri Lanka with their hand piece machines, and then the cutters here in America that are using masks. So that's kind of where we are today. So we're in a gem peg world world, and probably every commercial stove that you've ever seen is either cut in one of these places by one of these machines. So this is kind of what I wanted to look at today. I spent a lot of time talking to these guys, you know, living in Thailand, visiting friends, visiting uh, London, and really trying to learn what's different about this. And there is quite a lot different, even though the final result is exactly the same, the you know, faceted stone, uh, the technique, and the mentality of the technique is really different. And I thought that might be interesting for you guys to witness here today. So let's run through it. And I'm just going to give you an idea about what we're going to talk about as far as these techniques. And, and what I'm looking at here is what's dramatically different than the American technique, which is the way that I originally learned. But I'm sort of moved towards something else now. So the cutting order. And I'm going to go I, I'm going to do a slide in each one of these. But the cutting order is going to be very different than what you've actually used to. The preforming step is very different. The fact that everything is going to be in pretty much a free hand skin curl, the way that they cut the table, the way that they do the transfer, and the emphasis of color versus the point, which is something that's very almost opposite of what we see here. So let's do it for real. We see what we see. So I'm talking about the traditions of old Europe, but as we've already established, we can see that the technology of old Europe has spread all over the world. So even though I'm talking about something very specifically European in this talk, 
we're really talking about the, the techniques of the rest of the world because as the jam pick machine or the hand yeast machine spreads out into the cutting centers of the world, we see in all of these cutting centers European design machines of European techniques. So what we're seeing happening in Europe, which is the sort of a, the death of an old of an old idea, uh, is still alive and well in all of the Asian and South American places. So let's check it out. So if you're a European cutter or a Thai cutter or an Indian cutter, the first step that you're going to do in the cutting is always the preform. So in, I'm just going to say the other side, since that's the name of the talk, but when I say the other side, I just mean anywhere outside of America or anywhere outside of the universe of candies, right? That we, I'm sorry, mass and cheese. Because, you know, we're seeing the cinema kind of weird and technique in Australia, in parts of England, in Canada. So this is, to me, the American world, and this is everything else. So in America, it's pretty common that we're just going to take a piece of rock and dock it up, right? Like, that's in, that can be a normal way to do it. But in Europe, this is something that never, ever happens. You look at the rub, you figure out what we're going to do, and there's always a preforming step. So the preforming step is the most important part, and I'm going to show you another slide for this for a second, in a second. But the preform is the plan executed before we ever get to facets or copying or anything. The preforming is always the first step. Once we have done the preform, it's all about the girdle. So the girdle is part of preforming, but then there's going to be a fine step. You know, if you're going to make an oval or a pair or a cushion, something that doesn't have normally a faceted girdle. That's all going to be done by hand. And then, very opposite of the American technique, the table gets cut. So the table is the first facet to get cut. It gets cut first, and I want to show you why they do that for a reason. But if they cut the table first, they have established a reference point, and then everything is going to get built up off the table. Then we're going to cut the false crown facet. So this is very opposite of the American technique. Crown first. Then we do the transfer. There's never a transfer block. I think you know, if that that's true, I think mean, that's true. There's no transfer blocks outside of America for the American ethos. Um, and then the pavilions at the at the end. So we cut the pavilion, polish the pavilion. So when we talk about preforming, to me this is not to make a judgment, but when I see Americans posting things on the internet. To me, this is probably the number one missing moment of many American cutters' technique. In Europe and in Asia, preforming is really, really important because we're going to start with some weird brush shape. And in this case, I think you for all about 10 satellites. You know, sometimes the brush shape is amazing. You could just straight dock that and make a round or, or whatever. But the thing, the thing that's important about the preforming step it's not just about making the biggest stone. It's about orienting your inclusion. It's about orienting your color. Like if we're, these are all sapphires. So this is actually a great example, you know. Whether we're looking at white or purple or blue or icy and purple, sapphire has two colors inside, right? You've got an A-axis, you've got a C-axis. And, and as the cutter, we have the ability to manipulate what, what's the face-up color, right? So in this case, we've got woods and we've got greens and earth swirling around in there in some way. And so the preforming step is about establishing where the table is going to be, establishing where's the widest part of the stone is going to be the girdle, and then establishing a little bit of the crown and a little bit of the pavilion. Now, if you're used to rust dopping and kind of doing the preforming stage by fastening, right? Fastening to a cubic point, fastening the girdle, this might work. But if we do it freehand, the way that we're, I'm going to show you here in a second, we got the opportunity to change our mind. Maybe you start making what you think is the perfect shape for this stone, and then a little crack comes off, and you take one of the leakings out. Or you start to notice, once the skin comes off, that the color actually isn't as good as you thought. In the preforming step, we still got the chance to turn it upside down, to flip it around. Once you've docked it, you don't know what's inside of the wax or the glue anymore. So the preformal step is about removing the ingredients so that you don't have any surprises halfway through the stone, you know, a hole that didn't actually come out. So we're removing the illusions or at least manipulating them. And then really it's about when to orientate it for color and make sure that we get the best tone we can to that shape. 
Because you can see in this scenario, we've started with the rough, going through, and this is a rough preform. So this is the preforming that happens only in the fingers before we dot the rough. After that step, we dot it, and then you make the fine shape. So you can see that this preform still looks very different than that oval, but once we dot it, then we know where the table is going to be already. We established it, and we decided for sure this is the orientation of the sum, and then we can do the final perfect shape still by me. So, and we can see in all of these. These were all done by my wife, Victoria. So she's taken her up, preformed the incomplete up, found the table, figured out what the shapes, essentially like a P, and then once it gets done, we started to cut, and then we the final shape by hand. So these went from blobs to rectangles to rectangular cushions. And same here, we've got rough blobs. She's following the best shape that she could, which looks like hexagons. And then once she started cutting this one, or I think when she started doing the fine preforming, one of the inclusions actually did break the stone. So you see that one turned into an oval. I think she actually just cut that part off a little bit. So try to keep the big stone, but it wouldn't let us. So we adjust it, make it oval, and then that one spots that preform into that final shape. So this is something that we always see done. And in the factory environment, the person's job that does this is always the most experienced person. Because this is really the hardest job of all, which to me is funny that a lot of times it gets stiffed here in the States. The factory, in, in the factory, you need to have a lot of experience to do this. Because if you mess up the preform, if you turn the color so that it's not face up, you potentially have lost, you know, when you take some sapphires and rubies and emeralds, you potentially have lost thousands of dollars in each stone. So they always get back out to the most experienced person. Now, one thing that I think is really interesting, and this is something that my type factory manager kind of put into my mind. You know, coming from our point of view, from the mass point of view, and even from my nephew's point of view, we think about everything in terms of angle, right? Like the bottom of the stone, okay, sapphire, it's got to back a 35 degree angle, otherwise we're going to have a window, right? It's got to, you know, we don't want it to be too steep or else it's going to not be steep. And everything is built around the idea of angle. Like our whole conception of fastening is about angles. But if you're using a machine that doesn't have angles, how do you even imagine what you're going to do? And the whole thing is actually about percentages. So this is one thing, if you see my book, this is straight out of my book. This is one thing that my cutting factory manager taught me. He said, it's all about, you know, when, when we're talking about um, bicolor stones and black sea axis stones, and he said, it's all about the keel length. And I said, no, it's all about the angles. And he said, no, it's about the key length. And I thought about it, and I was like, we're saying the same thing. Because he's looking at, because he doesn't have angles, right? He's using the damn thing, and they're preforming this shape, or this shape, or that shape, based on a specific need or a specific stone. And he told me, if you have, you know, two colors in the stone, whether that's pleochromism or in the case of bicolor, he said, sometimes you want to mix those colors together, sometimes you don't want to mix those colors. You guys have all cut a black sea axis following before. You know, that one side is black. We don't want that color in there, right? It makes the stone look very dark. So he told me, if you have a dark sea axis or an ugly colored sea axis, you want to make the cue line as long as you can. Like if you're imagining this is an emblem cut or a step cut, you can make this as long as you can and then in my mind, I thought, well, what does that mean? What is he saying? This facet angle has to be really, really steep, you know, 70 degrees or something like that, 75 degrees. So what he was telling me was how the proportions work, how they view it from the proportion and, uh, aspect. And then I thought, okay, he's right. But what it means to us to use numbers is if we make this 70 degrees and 70 degrees, that means that it doesn't touch in the middle. It stays long and keeps a long bend. So this is just like a totally different, it's like speaking in a different language in a way. You've just translated Thai into English via this idea. And so you told me also, you want to keep my color separated, you make keel 70%, not as long as this, not as long as this one. And then if you want to mix the colors together, you want the keel to be closer or all the way to a cubic point. And the cubic point will mix the colors together as much as it's possible. Half from one side, half from the other side, everything gets blended. Sometimes that's good, you know, if you've got a blue and a green, 
Maybe you make a minty stone. But if you've got a blue and a black, or you know, black sea access tom money, and you mix them together, you're just going to get black or some kind of money blue. So that's a, that's a, a totally different idea about how to approach the idea of preforming. And so then they use that idea when they actually do the preforming, and you can see, you know, whereas they might, we sort of use this too, but when you're preforming, they're really looking about height percentage, you know. They know that a quartz needs to be 65% of the width. The height has to be 65% of the width. They know that already. They know that a sapphire can maybe be, I don't know, 50% of the width, and, and they don't think about critical angle. We think about percentage of height, which is pretty different type thing than what we are doing. So that's one interesting thing that I thought. Now, let's talk about the girdle. This is the biggest debate, I think, and I did a poll last year and discovered, I thought that faceted girls were, even though I know they're popular here in the American cutting world, I thought in the whole world, people maybe didn't like them. And I did a poll, and it was pretty much 50-50. Some people love faceted girls, some people love the smooth girls, some jewelers love faceted girls, some jewelers love smooth girls, and there's no consensus at all. Yeah, and there's and then anything in between as well. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the freehand girdle and just talk about how it's done. Because in my personal opinion, I love the look of a smooth, you know, if we're talking about a pair or an oval, I love the smooth look of it. You know, it's so clean, it's so crisp, it's so tidy. But it doesn't really work that well if you're doing knee point, right? Because you need to have a girdle facet to reference to be able to make all your facets match up. So how do we approach faceting when we're not going to have a girdle facet at all? And this is how they do it. So this is still, we're still kind of going back to the preforming step. They do that end shaping. You know, maybe you're going to have a rough preform shape. And then once they adopt it, that's when they really start to make that shape. There's no quill involved, there's no machine involved yet. And you can see it here. Um, this is, we did a hand shaping class for an online course last year, and I pulled this video out. So this is my wife, Victoria, demonstrating. You can see she's got a pear shape, piece of rope, docked up, and she's literally just going around and just by hand making the perfect oval sh or pear shape. And then once she's totally happy with the shape, then the fastening begins, then the table gets put on. And it's not until the outline shape is perfect that we can move forward. Because if you start fastening on, on stone where the outline shape is not perfect, you can make all the facets work and you can make it out of work. And then when you finish the stone, you've just spent a long time fastening an ugly outline shape. So that has to be, for us, that has to be the first step. I mean, when you see it being done in Europe, and a lot of what people seem done in Europe today is recutting, right? They're taking these poorly cut Sri Lankan stones with Thai stone, and they're perfecting them. They're reshaping them because they have, I guess, better handling control, perfect pairs, perfect bubbles, perfect cushions, or whatever it is, and then redoing all the facets in a European style, well, a brilliant top, usually a mixed cut stone, and being able to do the fine egg shaping freehand is essential. I mean, for recutting, you have to be able to do this. If you're going to take an already cut stone that has to go back to the setting, you can't cut the girdle. You can't touch the girdle. That's, that's the number one rule. You cannot touch the girdle if the stone has to go back in the setting. So then, if you're doing your normal meat point technique, how do you leave all the facets work together? I mean, obviously it's possible, but it's a sort of a dead man's skill. So adding this into your arsenal might be very powerful, though. From my experience, it takes a really long time. I've been doing this now like three years, come to the tutelage of my wife, I'm still not at the end of it. So it takes a little while. So let's talk about the table. This is one of the biggest areas of difference. The American cutters usually do table laps, trans uh, using the table adapter. Here we're gonna do, there's three different ways that I've seen the table being done, but they're always, it's always first. So sometimes, the table is just cut free hand in the preforming step without any dot. You just put it down there, that's it, it makes some pure empty dot. The other way is using the table cutter, which I'm going to show you here in a second. The third way is by bending the wax, probably the weirdest of all the ways. 
So cutting the table freehand means in the preforming stage, you put the stone down a little back, you cut it flat, but then you need to dot it after that. So the graph is the bites fall, the table will lie down, I guess. And so you've got your wax on your dot, you're gonna put the stone on the wax and then push it against the smell of them. And this is pretty much like our transfer block. It holds the dot straight, it pushes it against a flat 90 degree angle, and we can see him going in here. And he's just pushing it straight, so then the table is totally flat. And then when you start building your crown, you know that you're building it off of a, a plane that's that's even. Yeah. Where did they get the bacon away? I don't know. If they got away in frame for a box. I cut his lost in the video of him. You totally take the stone off and then realign it, and you couldn't use the pants of the game. I've got two more slides, and then I'll get to that. Okay. One. Um, okay, so the second way, of, and that's a good question, I, I'm going to talk about it. So the second way I've seen done is with the table cutter. And this is really a French thing. I haven't really seen this, well, a couple different kind of YouTube, but, but this is a, a good idea. So this one, the dot actually goes in for a 90 degree folder like this. And you can just, by hand, you're still hand cutting it, but it, it's making sure that it's perfectly straight. So you've already got your stone, the preforms in here pretty much straight. And then you're making sure that the table is totally flat with this 90 degree angle in depth. So this is sort of similar to the 45 degree depth that you might use for an alpha type or something like that. The final way, this, and so this, as I said, this has been used in France a lot. If people are still using that really old version of 1.0 jam pick that's just a stick with holes and there's no index, they don't have this. They do the craziest technique of all. They heat up the wax, they bend the stones with a 45 degree angle, my eye. And, I, and every time I see them do this, I'm just like, how do you do that? How, how do you know? But they also use the jam peg to, you know, while the wax is still hot, they will push it against the lap in the jam peg so that it is aligned to one of their holes. So that, that pushes it flat. Then they will polish it, cut it, polish it without any other facets push it back up straight, and then cut all the other path. And all that's done just by eye. It's just a stick, a flame, and the wax, and then it can jump back and forth. But, you know, this is such an unnecessary technique. I mean, to be able to do this would take years, right? I remember when I first met these guys, the old women cutters, and they said the first six months of their apprenticeship, all they were doing was docking. It was six months of just sticking up the stone and making sure it's straight. Because you have no reference point. You look at this, you look at the stick in your game, and your table's got to be perpendicular. The girl's got to be parallel. Otherwise, it's not right. So, this guy's been doing this for 50 years. He's quite good at this now. But I think it would take a long time to learn. And this, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to have to learn it. So now, let's talk about the transfer. If you're using a wooden stick without any angles or any indexes, the transfer is more free, I guess, and said. He's gonna take it off that stick, and he's gonna flip it over, and just put it straight back down. This is another thing that I think is really, really hard. I don't have a good video of him doing this, but I did have a video of me doing it, and I did it away. So, this is how I do my transfers, and I learned this from my wife, who learned this from the cutting factory in Geneva. So that's my dial, that's my stone, the crown is fully cut and finished. I'm going to use some super glue. Now, uh, this super glue is really right inside. So I'll put it straight on the dot. And I dip the dot, use the super glue. I take the table, and I just push it against the flat dot with the glue. And I bend that up, and I make sure that it's perfectly centered by eye. I look at it the long way, I look at it the wide way, and once it's centered, in about, I don't know, it was that half. That was done. I leave the room for 10 minutes, and I'm ready to the building. Those guys, when they do it, they're doing it with wax. So it's even harder because if the wax comes up over the girdle, you can't see what they're doing. I mean, you need the girdle like in the crown in order to be able to make sure the stone's straight. Otherwise, if you cut a great crown and a great, great pavilion, then the girdle will be crooked, right? So they do all the transfer by eye. And like I said, there are no transfer blocks outside of the American technique. That's a purely American invention for the mass machine. So finally, uh, we've got this emphasis of color and yield over the meat points. And this is something that every European cutter has sold me pretty much. The crown of the stone, everybody sees it. 
It's got to be curved, right? If you look at a beautiful sapphire and the table's crooked and some of the facets are all messed up, unacceptable. It's got to be curved. But when you flip the stone over and you're working on the pavilion side, at the pavilion side, nobody sees it once it's in the jewelry, right? It's in there. If it's a little bit off, but you push the color into the exact place you need it to be, and I'm really talking about sapphires here. You know, you've got sapphires that have zone or whatever. Just dots of color. You do whatever you did in their, in their philosophy. You do whatever you have to do to get the color to come up. If you've got a color center and you have to push some facets and make the cue look slightly crooked or whatever you have to do, that's acceptable. If the meat points on perfectly perfect on the bottom for them, that's acceptable because sometimes if you have to, let's say, skew the culet slightly off to get the color to reflect into the face, to get the face to look really, really blue, as blue as it could be, then it's not possible that all the facets can still be the same thing. Some of them are like this, some of them are like that, and the meat points have made it skewed a little bit. Now, this is one thing that I've been really looking at them a lot for, because it's very hard even for me to get off the idea that all the lines are going to be perfect, and then all the facets are going to be the same as on all the sides. When they're telling me, even for the crown, the crown ends are not supposed to be the same anyways. You know, he's telling me, but if the stone is longer, then the end has to be tilted up, otherwise it does this or that, I'm not sure. This is something I'm still trying to learn from them, but this is something that is very different. I, I've seen, I, I, I know this probably been doing opinions about this, but I've seen people on forums here in America saying, I would take bean points over color people dead. And when I heard that, I was like, you don't buy and sell stomachs in because that's just not how it works. If you have a sapphire and you cut it perfectly to meat point and you lose color, you're losing money. Like if you're trying to sell a stone and make money, the color is the most important thing. Not saying that they should be ugly or sloppy or anything like that. Your doctor said, you guys are doing really, really good and perfect work. And you see that the, the, the outline shape that they're doing is very symmetrical. The facet points are pivot. You know, the, the facet's all the same size. When you look at it compared to the diagram, you might not even be able to tell that it wasn't cut with some machine with index. This is cut out of jam pick with that, that old jam pick, which is just stick in wood. There's no index, there's no angles. They just do this by the observing the can and by the adjustment of their jam pick. And they're getting the same kind of meat point results that we're getting following the diagram. But they're custom tailoring it because they're not looking at that and they're not even thinking about the ankles. They're just looking at the stone and they're really trying to look inside and see that color and figure out if I adjust this facet, if I fit sludge, just this one facet maybe. And I've seen really crazy stones that they've shown me, you know, a purple sapphire with a little spot of red in there. And he said he just tilted three of the facets. In the after photo, it was like the stone turned red. I, I, it was like a magic trick. I painted it and believe it. I should have put that picture in here, but I don't have it. He showed his guns on. But um, so this is one thing. You know, they're not that concerned about what the back of the stone looks like. If it's a real sloppy or if the mind is open, you know. And and I think this is a big difference. You know, for us, obviously, if you're doing competition, the meat point is part of the goal, right? You have to get the meat point. It's part of the competition. But for them, the competition is how to get the best color, which is going to be how to get the most twenty ounces. So. so that's a little bit different on the night here. So I got a couple just really short videos to show you, just so we can see what this litter was like in that. So this is a French cutter up in the mountains of France. He's using a very old fashioned machine. So the, the hand crank machine pretty much is gone these days. There's only a couple of companies that still do that um, anywhere, but he does. And, uh, and you can see he's doing the preform stuff right now. So he's already got his rough preform done, and he's doing a metal cut. So just like you would, if it's a geometrical shape like an emerald cut, the girl is still fast, but they're not going to do that for you again. But if it's an oval or a pair, he's going to hold it in his hand. You see he's got this little platform right here that you can adjust, you know, pour in the, the outline of the stone to. So that's step one. He's done his preforming, now he's doing his fine shape if he's going to get the perfect emerald cut. Then he's going to go to the cuttings. So and now he's actually using the jam peg up here and you can see up here, it's, he's got the stone looking at the can sit, and he's using the eight index ring 
to make the facets realogenic, and he's going up and down in the holes to make the different tiers. So he's got, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three, whatever it is. And then once he's got all the facets cut, he will go to the final step. So you've got a whole other machine to do this. This machine collapsed off the map. So one table has a preforming thing, one table has a cutting thing, one table has a polishing form. This guy has three tables in his house, and they'll bid. So now he's in the polishing, and he's still hammering me. This is like a probably a tin or a leg lap, and now he's pretty much doing the same thing that we do. If you couldn't see that he's only a jam bag, this would still be our architect quill, right? You just saw that and stuff that it's not. But sweeping, you know, going step by step, going back to all the facets that you already did. We can see a, a really similar thing coming in London. The London guys are also hand cranking on you know, the cutting, but they don't have that French jam thing. They've got just the piece of wood, the bolt, and, and the stick in the hand. And so you can see when he goes, this is the polishing side now. So, so they're splitting up in two different jobs. You have the, the guy on the right, he's doing the cutting, and then it switches over to the guy on the left, he's doing the polishing. The polishing guy doesn't have a hand crank. He's got a motor on his machine. But for the cutting, they still like the feel and the, the you know the control of speed by by hand crank. And so then he when he goes to polish the other guy's stone, he just finds all the guts in. If it's a totally different machine, a different terminate, a different duty doing it, but they're still able to go back and find all those facets and polish them without blowing out all the neat ones. So the last thing that I want to show you guys today, just to give you a glimpse of something even more, I guess, extreme than this, is precision milling cutting. So I got to go to this factory in Sri Lanka probably a year before the pandemic, and I was totally shocked about what I found here. And I'm thinking, Melly, I don't even know what I would see. You know, is it a computer? Is it a robot that's cutting a thousand tiny stones all day, which is what they do in China? Um, nope, it wasn't that. It was this. If you're old enough, you probably recognize this as a lead machine. To go back to like the 1950s or 16th or 70s, this was one of the popular machines that we would buy in America. So they've taken this lead machine and they have essentially supercharged it. So the way that the lead machine works, if you haven't seen this before, it's pretty much like a regular mass machine, except that the, the quill comes off and it's sitting out a little hanger like this. So you put it down in there and it has a little lock so that we, it hits the, the, in, the angle that we want. And, but it, but it, it's being held by these two little arms over here, so you can take it out and move it. So what they've done is, oh, let me show you one more step first. So, so we'll go in order. Starting with the preform. This is a mass production factory, so they're dotting up 100 some that whites. And they are actually, they are dotting around because they have a different technique than what the other guys in Europe are using. Because this is, this is the fact that it only goes round road. Yeah, we're talking about three millimeters, two millimeters, one millimeters. I think down to 0 0.8 they can do. So they dot all the stones at once on metal docks, like similar to what we would use. And then they've got these two preforming machines. One of them is doing a 45 degree angle, so they're preforming a pavilion really, really fast. Then they're turning into another preforming thing. You can just roll it like this and making the grow really, really fast, and then they calibrate it, make sure that it's the right size, because they're doing really big calibrations. If I remember correctly, this guy can do 5,000 preforms a day. So this is great, right? So then, once the preform's done, they go to three different people to do the rest of the work. So the first step is the table. So similar to what we just saw in the European technique, they do the table first, and that's the starting point. So she's got a special adapter, and this is the same one that we see in the lead machine, it's like a T-shape the, the dot goes in there and you just use it to cut the table. So she has the table first. It's pretty much going to get the whole top of the stone. And then the crown cutters get it. And so the reason why this machine is so interesting and so different, notice the hanger thing here, this part. So you see the lead issue before. You see this hanger, but there's only one in America. They put on three. So one's high, one's medium, one's low. So you've got mains. Stars, breaks. The facet or the angles are preset. So once they get the whole thing to the right height, which is just going to happen on the first stone, then they can do a thousand stones in a row and they don't have to choose any angles. They just go from one meter to the second meter, 
to the third finger, and that's going to cut all three tiers of the round ribbon. And you can see it here, and then you can see another view over here. So that so they can just lift it up, spin this thing around, and brock it back and went to yellow and cut the other ecosystem fastings. So they can do it really, really fast. And since the stones are so small, there's no way of it. They do everything with the polishing. So you can see they've got uh, iron and copper. So this is what in zero um, 8K and 60K or something like that. Uh, or no, 8K and 14K. So basically, you know, 14K polish. And when they slip it over and do the ability the, the side, I mean, around running, it only has two steps on the ability, right? Mains and brakes. Mains and brakes. So they do one here, they do one here. So when you add all this up, plus the preforming, plus the document, every stone takes five minutes and start the end. It's a dollar sixty to have to cut, you send with your rock, they send you back a perfect So I I, I knew I saw this, right? I went there, I saw this, and I'm thinking, okay, five minutes of stone, they're cutting like fifty thousand stones among the fourteen people. The quality was not very good, right? Can't. They don't even run the rubber. There is a... So I took one home. I took it into the microscope. This is a thing on the microscope that was cut in five minutes. It's probably not going to win the USFG competition, but it's pretty good. I mean, the meat points are all on. The table size is the right size. The brakes are open. You can see the cumulus is covered in the center. The brake types that are, you know, they're not they're not a hundred percent, but they're probably magnified. They're really, really good. For a five minute stone, it costs a dollar fifty for you. Uh, pretty I, I was very impressed with this. The fact that they were able to do it so good, so fast, so easy. And, and they can pretty much do it with any type of regular stone. So that uh, to me was very, very impressive. So that was what I wanted to show you guys today. A little bit of the technology, a little bit of the techniques, seeing some of in action, and a little bit of the help with process. So thank you guys, and I think we've got peace.